speaks and summons all the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets from Zion perfect in beauty God shines forth Evening everyone. Evening Phil. Hi Jord. And evening Darren. Evening. Hi. Thanks for joining us tonight to uh, share some thoughts on Psalm 50. It's really good to have you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Is it our first Northerner film, or have we? Have we had <laughs> well, John of Manel, he's, oh uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm your last Northerner. That was what I was. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, as you saw from the song um, and the title slide that Phil shared with us, and um, we're going to be thinking about Psalm 50 um, this time. If you remember, um, our last Psalm was Psalm 49 with Wayne, wasn't it, Phil? Um, and and he was sort of thinking about those two ways. Um, the way of life or, or the way of death and and if you want to it, it was a very comprehensive look at that psalm wasn't it so if you want to look back at that video um you can do but we'll just share our, our usual uh, big picture um of where we are in the uh the psalms um we're still in um book two um where we've looked at how that was more of the collective um thinking about the people um we can see um this is another psalm um of Asaph and the title. Um, I think as we heard from the song, um, we've got the theme of Zion in there, mm -hmm. Phil. Um, and I think Darren's gonna pick up a little bit on um, Christ in um, the Psalms as well. So before- A bit of Selah as well, Jordan. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, I missed that six. one. Yeah. Absolutely, verse six. So um, before we sort of get into the Psalm, Darren, um, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are um, and, and your background? Well, as everybody already knows, I'm a northerner and proud of it. So there you go. Yeah, um, I'm actually from West Lancashire, which is uh, Ormskirk, West Lancashire, towards Liverpool. Although now I live in Halifax in Yorkshire, which is where my wife Karen is from. Uh, I'm married to Karen. I'm 57, despite appearances. I've got two kids. Um, I've no idea how old they are, but I think, Jordan, you know better than I do. I think they're 27 and 24. I think uh, James has just, just married. Um, and, and sadly, she's married somebody from the Midlands, but there you go. <laughs> anyway, such is life. Yeah, so I'm married. I'm a, I'm a financial advisor, which usually ends all conversations. I, I, run, a business, <laughs> I, run, I run a business up here. Um, all the family work with me, as do others, um, enjoy my work. And I also the reason why I'm mentioning that, actually, is because I wouldn't want anybody to think that I, or for that matter, virtually anybody who's a Christadelphian is a an expert in Hebrew or Greek, you know what I mean? We've not, we've studied it in our own way as well as doing our own jobs and we do our best with it because basically we love God, we love the word and we're just trying our best. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that's where I'm coming from. Um, and on the subject really um, for tonight, I know we're going to do a particular psalm, psalms, but when I first got married, um, we lived next door to a chap who was a policeman and he did, he did have a very bad reputation for booking everybody. He was a traffic police officer and he had a bad reputation because he was regularly um, booking police officers as well, which is most rare. He wasn't liked within the police force, but he had a bit of a tragedy in his family. And um, over the garden fence, he, once said, he said to me one day that he'd had this difficulty. And he said to me, he said, I've decided to read the Psalms. You probably agree with that, wouldn't you? Now, I was only young, but... I said, well, well, yes. And he says, well, I'll go and read some Psalms. And I thought, well, I hope he reads the right one. I'm not sure which one he's going to read. Anyway, he came back to me a couple of days later and he was not a religious man at all. He just said, I've been reading through the Psalms and I found it very helpful. I'm really struggling. And I found that very helpful. So he had no guidance from me. He just had heard that the Psalms was a good place. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You know, it's an interesting sort of link, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mark Psalms for Challenging Times. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely linked to that theme, doesn't it? Yeah. So so based on that, Darren, what, what would you say a psalm is? Well, it's interesting that question because you've played the music early on at the beginning. Um, a psalm is basically, um, I'm sure there's a more complicated way of putting it, but it's a song to music. It's it's a poem to work to music. Um 
one one song that you're probably too both of you too young to remember um by a man called john denver i think it's a good example about what what music is about you fill up my senses like a night in the forest like the mountains in springtime like a walk in the rain like a sleepy blue i can't remember the rest of the words but basically john denver you know sadly he also <laughs> he also sang i'm leaving on a jet plane and that's how sadly he passed away but anyway um but what he was saying in that song, Annie's song, was basically, I cannot sum up my love for Annie. And he was using colourful language to say, you know, you're like a walk in the springtime, or a walk in the rain, rather. And in a sense, there's an element of that in the, in the Psalms, that it's inspired word of God, but whoever the psalmist is with each psalm, he's saying things that mean profound things to him. And we've got to try and tap into that message and see why it's so wonderful. So that's what a psalm is to me. It, and ultimately, it's a way of giving praise to God, because that's what God wants. Um, and I think as well, it's a way of looking at ourselves. Um, the psalms are very personal. Um, I believe you have or you're going to do Psalm 51. I don't know if, it's, if, if people have already heard that. The next psalm in the, in the order. One of the things I'd say about Psalm 51, what's that got to do with my song? But Psalm 51 was written by a king, yeah. the king. And in that psalm, he's opening his heart up, saying, I know I've sinned, I know I've sinned, I've done terrible things. He doesn't just say that to himself and to God, he puts it in writing and has everybody singing about it. Everybody in the nation knew it. So you're really opening yourself up when you're, when you're offering a psalm, a bit like a personal prayer, really. And that's what we need to try and do when we read them. Um, all those different themes that you saw, we try and look at them. But what's it teaching me? So when, when we're singing a psalm or singing a hymn, it's not just a nice tune. What, what are the words teaching me? What am I going to get from it? And that's what we, for me, it's one of the reasons why I like the psalms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we looked at that once where in the New Testament talks about teaching one another in psalms and yeah. hymns and spiritual yeah. songs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to... Actually, one, one Christadelphian, I think it was a Christadelphian many years ago, referred to the psalms as the fifth gospel. Mm. Um, if people don't know what I'm saying, um, there's four gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. One Christadelphian called the psalms the fifth gospel. Well, you, you know when you had on your screen before about christ in the psalms or jesus in the psalms how you worded it when you read the four gospels you find out i know this is an oversimplification but you find out what jesus did but when you read the psalms you find out how he felt when it was happening you really get into his heart into his mind and how he's really struggling and that that's one of the reasons why i like the psalms so much i, I think i've learned more about jesus in the psalms than i have actually in a way than the, than the four Gospels in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. That was really apparent, wasn't it? We did um, Psalm 22 about this time last year mm -hmm. with, uh, with 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 Archie, didn't we? And um, yeah. he really brought that across, didn't he, about how, what Jesus was going through on the cross and um, how Psalm 22 was almost like that insight into... Absolutely. What my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are lots of Psalms. I mean, if people are listening and making notes, uh, I've quickly made a note of psalms that, for me, jump out about Jesus, although one or two writers have said that they think every psalm has Jesus in it somewhere. Now, some would say, well, well that's not possible because we can't find him, but some people say they can find him in every psalm. I, I once did a study many years ago on Psalm 40, and I found Jesus in every phrase, let alone the psalm. Um, but Psalm 22 is an obvious one. 23 is another one. 31, 40, 41, 55, 69. They're all about his feelings, how his relationships with his disciples, with his relationships with his family, and the role that he was supposed to fulfill, Psalm 110, how he's supposed to be like somebody famous in the Old Testament, man called Melchizedek, you know, it's, it, it's really profound what you learn there, and sometimes one of the things that Jesus does, which is, I think it's brilliant, when he's, well, of course it's brilliant, but when he's quoting certain Psalms to the ordinary people, he finishes them, but when he's quoting them to the religious leaders who knew their Bibles, sometimes he stops quoting and they finish it off in their own mind. Mm. Psalm 8, um, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise or ordained strength, depending on which version you read. 
he stops there when he quotes that in Matthew. But when you read it in, in the Psalms, it basically it more or less says, in the presence of mine enemies. <laughs> yeah. So they knew what he was saying. The children were shouting and being joyful, but they understood what he was saying. And it's, there's, there's all this tension going on as well. Even though originally the psalm was written about something else, not Jesus. Mm. It's the inspired word of God. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah, but that's helpful that you've shared some of those other psalms. We've got a video we did a few months back, didn't we, um, with Ben about Christ in the psalms. Yeah. If people want to delve into that topic in more detail um i like that explanation you gave of the fifth gospel uh that helps capture it yeah well, well i'd like to say it was mine but it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> a northern christadelphian but not yet yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got psalm 50 tonight um who wrote psalm 50 then you mentioned about famous yeah. people writing psalms from the old testament yeah well unusually for a start it wasn't david a good number of them were written by david weren't they and depending which version you've got it literally says in my bible psalm 50 a psalm of asaph and you won't be surprised to know that asaph was pretty good at music <laughs> it is a song set to music uh, if you want to turn with me or you don't need to turn with me but i'll just quote some verses from first chronicles um chronicles basically first and second books of chronicles um we can put it on, the, on the screen for you darren we can just quickly well, if, if you could do yes uh, yeah, yeah. first chronicles chapter 15 please you, you you're better on technology than i am it's not me it's phil I, i'm not going <laughs> to take any credit for this <laughs> right well so if we look there um first verse one and two first of all and david made him houses in the city of david and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. And David said, none ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites, only they can do it. For them hath he, the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto, the, unto him forever. Perhaps if you come down with me, please, to verse 16. Oh, very impressive. Thank you. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers. So the singers that were going to sing songs of joy when the things that David wanted to happen, the singers with instruments of music, psalteries, harps, cymbals, sounding, in other words, uh, and lifting up the voice, so singing as well as the musical instruments. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and his brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah. And here we've got it. So here's the Asaph that we read, um, wrote Psalm 50. Um, whilst were there in chronicles perhaps you can come with me to chapter 16 please <clears throat> chapter 16 not verse sorry yeah oh i see you have to manically right <laughs> got you i'm most impressed so anyway <laughs> verse one um, so they brought the ark of god and set it in the midst of the tent that david had pitched for it and they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before god just a comment here, because this, this is picked up actually in the psalm. I'm, I'm sure people will know, but if you don't know, you, you, you'll soon pick up on this. In the Old Testament, they had sacrifices of lambs, of, of animals and whatever, to, to show their uh, thanks to God and to recognize that they were themselves sinful. So the system of the law gave them systems of sacrifices to basically to say, picked up, this is picked up in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10, the sacrifices was basically to say, I know I am sinful and therefore I'm going to offer a sacrifice to say I'm sorry, I suppose is one way of putting it. Um, verse five now, please. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and Asaph, Asaph the chief, and next to him Zerachiah, Jeel, and it's all right, easy for you to say when you're on the screen, but Shemaram, she, uh, Shemaramoth and Jeel, etc. But verse the end of the verse, but Asaph made a sound with symbols. So he's a singer, it makes a sound with symbols. He's musically in, inclined. Okay. And uh, if, finally, if you'll come with me to chapter 25, please, I won't put you um, completely through your paces because I was going to go to Second Chronicles, so we don't need to go there. But Second Chronicles tells us something else. I'll give you the chapter and verse for people to look up at the leisure. Um, but First Chronicles 25, verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman. So they call the people from the house of Asaph, verse 2, 
of the sons of Asaph. So just pointing out that Asaph, Asaph, Asaph is not just a singer. He's a chief singer. He's not just a musician. He's a chief musician. He's not just some good bloke at, quite good at doing it. The king chose him. The king separated him and God separated him as well. So that's the point. And in, in Second Chronicles um, chapter 29, I don't know if you want to go to I'm only going to say one verse anyway, but there in Second Chronicles, it refers to him as a seer, as a prophet. Second Chronicles 29 and verse 30, please. Thanks very much. I'm most impressed. Moreover, Hezekiah, so now we've got a different king, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. Basically, he was a man of incredible talent. He wasn't just musical. He was a prophet, effectively, for God as well. So now we know the credentials of who wrote Psalm 50. It's not just some bloke from Jerusalem. He works for the king. He's a Levite, he's of the tribe that's able to do these things, um, and he's impressive and very good at, at writing songs and also prophecy. So the words are inspired by God um, and very good, therefore. So um, I'm going to ask myself a question, actually, really, uh, here, is basically, what is Psalm 50 all about? I, I think that's a good question to ask, and... I'll be honest with you, until I sat down to think about it, I, I asked myself that simple question. What is Psalm 50 all about? Because if you just read it, you might, especially if you're reading my version, the, the King James Version, it might not mean too much for you. But I'll put it to you simply and then we'll have a, have a look at it. We all sin. <clears throat> Everybody sins. Everybody Sin means to miss the mark. So if you're firing a bow and arrow at a, at a target, um, unless you hit it absolutely dead center, you've missed the mark. It's not perfect. There is only one human being that's ever been perfect. And that, of course, is Jesus himself. So we're all sinful. And the Psalms, or, or this particular Psalm, is, is a song from Asaph to say from God. And he makes it clear about the greatness of God in comparison to the people he was talking to in verse one. You're all missing the mark. I want to pull you up, I'll use a, a northern analogy, uh, or saying, pull you up by your socks. You know, you, you, you've, got, you've got to be better. God is saying, I want you to be better. But more significant than this, isn't, this isn't just to anybody. This is to his people. He refers to his people as my people. I suppose here there's a simple lesson, really, for all of us who profess to be Christians of any sort. We have to have standards. Just having faith is, is insufficient. You know, to say I believe in God and Jesus Christ and be a mass murderer doesn't work. It doesn't fit. That's not to say all sin can be forgiven. Of course it can. But we have to try and have standards. And God expects us to try to have standards. And this psalm is basically all about your standards are not up to scratch. And this is what I want you to do. If you don't do it, well, you're going to be judged. But if you do do it, you're going to be judged. <laughs> I've deliberately said that. We think of the word judgment as a negative thing, don't we? It's like um, I, I once did an exam. I, this has sprung to mind. It's the most pressure I think I've ever been under. I did an exam where it was a role play with actors, with camera crew watching me. If I'd failed, I would have lost my job on the spot. I had to get, I think from memory, about 85% of the things that I had to talk to these pretend people about, these actors. And when, when it had finished, um, the manager who was appointed to the job came in and said, how do you think you've done? I said, I haven't got a clue. I just hope I've passed. She says, no, how do you think you've done? I said, I, I don't know. I just hope I've passed. He says, you're the first person to get 100%. I said, I'm not bothered. I've just passed them out. That's all that mattered. Now, our standards as individuals, as human beings, are not God's standards. We're never going to get 100%. But we should try. 
And by the way, I do keep failing. I don't want anybody thinking, oh, it's all right for you. You're a 57-year-old Christadelphian from the north of England where there's nothing to do and therefore you can't sin. <laughs> We're not, we all have our difficulties, don't we? So I'm trying to be reassuring. But at the same time, we've got to... So going back to the idea of judgment, I was being judged. And when I was being judged, I told I got 100%. So what? But I got 100%. That's positive. Mm. But if I'd been told I'd failed, I was still being judged. Mm. The judgment is all about, ultimately, there's going to be a kingdom that's going to be established by God. And those by grace who are saved will be allowed to live in that kingdom. It's going to be wonderful. Every one of us who's going to be in that kingdom is going to be judged, not just the ones who fail mm. so we know to know what the standards are are you with me though so far we've not even looked at the cell you've uh, probably heard about you probably know what i'm like i, probably, I hope, hope you don't mind if it's two hours i'll try not <laughs> it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't need to be so right let's have a quick look at it then um actually before we do could we could we have it read please yeah sure yeah, yeah. i can read that if you want mm -hmm. okay. thank you psalm 50 <clears throat> Psalm of Asaph. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. <clears throat> Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself. See that. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel. And I will testify against you. I am God, thy God. I will not rep reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and the, excuse me, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words be behind thee. When you saw a thief, when you consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers, <clears throat> thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. <clears throat> Thank you very much, George. Um, I'm not too concerned about it, but don't let you be too put off. My dog's just managed to get into the room and roll in front of me and make as much noise as he wants. But anyway, mm -hmm. she wants rather. So, um, yeah, so there's basically, I think, I hope that my introduction made that a little bit easier to follow. Um, first of all, first. <coughs> The mighty God. There's, God has all sorts of titles. Um, my, the way I understand it, he, uh, you know, I've got lots of names. I've got lots of titles. My, for example, I'm Mister. I'm not nothing fancy. I'm Mister. I'm Dad. I'm Son. I was Grandson. Um, I look forward to being Granddad. 
I'm a financial advisor, I'm all of these different things, but I only have one name. My name is Darren Guy, okay? God has lots of different titles, mighty one, the powerful, all, all, all these different things in Hebrew. And he has one name, which is there listed, which is the Lord, which is a, a, another fancy Hebrew word. But what it's saying is, I am he. This is what the psalmist is saying. We're talking now about the creator of everything. He's not just something that is carved onto a piece of wood that people look up to. He is the creator. I'm the one who was there at the rising of the sun because I started it. He put it in motion. We know this from other passages of scripture. So anyway, so that's the context. God is God and you lot are sinful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, I won't pick on my sons as I normally would, but I have sadly, my father passed away only a couple of months ago, but, um, my, I, I was my father's son, of course, and my, my brother as well. If I'd done anything particularly bad or wrong or whatever, do I think my father would still have loved me? Yes, I do. But it doesn't mean to say he would have been impressed with it. And it doesn't mean to say he wouldn't have corrected me or told me off, even in his frailty when he was 91. That's a father's job to say so. But he would have still loved me and he would have desperately tried to cling on to convert me around. And this is what's happening here. You people is saying are out of order. But verse, look at the, the, the words used, verse five, my saints, my called out ones. Um, verse seven, my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. You see that the relationship. I am God, you are my people. So when, when God sees people that are sinning, he doesn't like it. But when he sees people that are his people sinning, it, it hurts him even more. Mm -hmm. So of all the people on the whole of the planet, if any one or person had done something dreadful, committed murder, which person would have, who would have upset my dad most for the per that person to commit the murder, either me or my brother? So the condemnation or the upset or the criticism is, is stronger. So there's a lesson here for us. If we want to follow the God, the creator of the whole universe and Jesus Christ whom we sent, try to please him with our behavior. And that's, that's what he's picking on here. So um, verse two, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. There was a temple. In David's day, there was a temple, King Solomon's temple, really, but there was a temple system, and that was destroyed, and then in, and then a second one was built, and that was destroyed, and there'll be a third one, which will be the, effectively the temple under Jesus. But that's where God expected to, to get the praise and the glory that he was entitled to. And it should have been done by all of the different systems that have been laid down in the rules, in the law, all to give glory to God. But instead, they were used as a form of ritual, as a form of people getting out of them what they wanted instead of what God expected from them. So, verse 3, our God shall come and not keep silent. He's done it before. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. In, Act, in Exodus 19, God came and the people saw the fire. He's done it before, and he'll do it again. And this is not just in their time. It's also futuristic as well for, for us as well. God will intervene. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. That's what he's intending doing. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So the people who've made a covenant with him and are in a relationship with him, the ones who are doing the sacrifices, the bullocks, the rams, the pigeons, the turtle doves, whatever it will be that they could afford. And he says there from ver effectively from verse eight onwards to verse 12 i suppose or verse 13 well i i know what your sacrifices are because i instituted them i did them through the house of levi through aaron and the, and, and the, the priests and, and all of that i know what they are i know what you've been doing them 
I'm not going to condemn you for doing your, doing your sacrifices. However, I prefer it that you'd have done them in the right way. And I preferred it if you'd done them in a way that I would have got, you'd have been thinking about giving glory to me with rather than your own traditions and your own rituals and you thinking you've ticked a box and now you've become one of my people. It doesn't work like that. What God wanted, and I'll give you a good example in a second, was not just the literal sacrifices. We're called by Jesus, um, as I'm sure everybody listening will know this, but we're called, we are called by Jesus to be baptised go through the saving, through the water of baptism, and then remember him on a regular basis through eating bread and drinking wine. He does want a bit more than that, though. He wants us to love one another as he has loved us, you know, and all that sort of thing. It's our behaviour. So, um, verse 13, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? You're giving back to me that which I created in the first place. I'm not impressed when you're doing it for your own ritualistic ways. What I want from you is this, or you can't see. I want that. Mm. I want that. I need your heart. I need you as a person. Now, there's a good person, a good example, rather, of an individual who committed terrible sin. He was known as the man after God's, God's own heart. You're with me already. Some of you will be already. Coincidentally, if there is such a thing, it's the very next psalm, Psalm 51. Now, David had committed murder. He committed adultery. If you turn over your page, if you're in your Bibles, uh, to Psalm 51, um, we read there about all the things that um, David is saying. Verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I, I realize what I've done and he's struggling because of it. He then says in verse, from verse 14 onwards, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. I, I know what I've done. I committed murder. Please put that away from me. I can't undo the murder, but please forgive me for it. Um, God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. It's interesting how the Psalms are songs to praise God and whatever. And here David is saying, I want to sing along. He was struggling to sing. You know what it's like when you're, when you're feeling really depressed or really mourning somebody. You can't sing as well because your heart's not in it. David was struggling to sing. But then he says something which is really, really important. Verse 16. Thou desirest not sacrifice, else I will give it. Thou delightest not in birth, burnt offerings. You didn't really want me to offer a sacrifice for murder and adultery because actually in the law there isn't one. You weren't looking for some a sacrifice for that. What you really wanted was this God. This, David acknowledges it, and that's why he's the man after God's own heart. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart or crippled heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. I know you're forgiving me, God, because I'm crushed when I consider what I've done, and I'm deeply, deeply sorry. So come back with me to Psalm 50. This is the same message, effectively, that's coming out from God, but in a less personal way than David does it, because we know the context of David. So there, um, reading verse 14, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the most high God. Don't just do rituals. Be thankful for everything I've done for you. That's the psalmist talking for God, effectively to the audience and to us be thankful verse 15 and call upon me says god in the day of trouble turn to me keep turning to me repent which means to turn keep going back to me i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me i wanted glory all along and i will deliver you i will save you in challenging times and when i save you It'll be partly because you're giving me glory. So he, he's, in the psalm, he's criticising them for their poor behaviour. Then he gives them a, a shaft of light, of hope. And then he turns to really some of the awful things that they were doing. Um, verse uh, 16, but unto the wicked. Uh, for me, the lesson here is, he doesn't just say, you've sinned, you need to repent. 
and I'll forgive it. He makes it clear what sin is. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he doesn't lighten it. He doesn't say, don't worry, because you, you're a follower of Jesus now, or you follow me, you'll be fine. He points out, you shouldn't do this. That's why it hurt David so much. And we have to be hurt as well. Anyway, but unto the wicked, God said, what hast, hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? You, you, you're taking it all casually. You're not really, they're just words. You, you, you're not, you don't feel it. Verse 17, seeing thou hatest instruction, when I've given you instruction before, you're just choosing to ignore it. That's what God is saying of his people. And carest, castest thy words behind thee. I've given you all sorts of instruction. You're just throwing it on the floor. You're just not bothered. That's what he's saying. Well, that's not acceptable. It's not going to last. When thou sawest, um, verse 18, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consent, consentest with him. You, you're almost as one of them. You, you just, you saw a thief. Oh, yeah, he's oh, and he doing well. He's getting away with that. That's not what my people should be like. And, and that's, you know, thy mouth speaketh evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. There's an individual in the New Testament that Jesus meets um, in John chapter 1, where Jesus, in meeting Nathaniel, he says, ah, an, an Israelite in whose mouth is no guile. It, in other words, he's not deceitful. What, he speaks the truth. He, when, he, when he sees something he doesn't think is right before God, he, he says it. And Jesus was commending him for that. Mm. Well, we've got to be the same. And they, that was their problem. You, verse 20, thou sittest and speakest against thy brother and slanderest thine own mother's son. You know, you're, you're behaving poorly and you're upsetting your own mother by slandering your brother. You think that's acceptable behavior. So this is, these are the sorts of things that he's saying. But then we get to verse 22. Now, consider this. Consider this. In fact, it's a word which is used. I know it's a different language, but in the Old Test, in the New Testament about Jesus, consider our high priest and professor of our profession, Jesus. Consider Jesus. Think carefully. That's what it means. Just, oh, yeah, 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 I know it. Yeah. No, think about this. The word it, it, from the dictionary comes means to separate mentally, to distinguish, to fully understand. Okay. Fully understand what I'm saying to you, says God through Asaph. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces. So beware, beware. I'll tear you in pieces if you forget me, sort of thing. And there be none to deliver you. None can help you when God is against you. When we're in difficulty, we turn to God. If we deny God, he'll deny us. That, that's sort of the message, isn't it? But then verse 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. You see, God keeps coming back to praise. Keep praising him for what he's done. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Talk about him. Listen about him. It, it, I can assure you, I'm not talking about me as a speaker. God is getting more pleasure listening to you because you're interested in listening than anything I can do. He sees that there are people who are interested in him. That, that's really encouraging. Whoso offereth pray glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, his, his lifestyle, not just his communication by mouth, will I show the salvation of God. So the name of Jesus in the Old Testament is, is Joshua or Yahshua. God is Savior or God is salvation. So some people say Jesus' name means Savior. No, it doesn't. It means God is Savior. Everything about Jesus is all about God is the Savior. But here, this is lovely. The very last phrase in the whole of the psalm talking about sin and repenting and get closer to God if you get your conversation, your behavior right, I will show you the salvation of God. I will show you Jesus. <laughs> we see Jesus now, don't we? We know what he's done and we can be forgiven in him. But we've got to remember him and think about him and, and read about him and try to copy him. And yes, fail and seek forgiveness in him and go through the waters of baptism to prove that we're following him. And love one another, as I touched upon before, as he did. That's the salvation of God. And ultimately, we're looking forward to a time. And so was Asaph. So were all these people of all those days ago. 
they were looking for a time when the kingdom of God will be established in their words by Messiah. And we know that that Messiah is Jesus. What a fantastic, fantastic way to end. You see why I like reading the Psalms. It's quite dour, this. It's all about, oh, we've done that wrong. We've done the other wrong. We've done. And God says on a few occasions, yes, but if you do this, I'll look after you. I'll forgive you. And he ends with God's salvation in Jesus. We've got a lot to be thankful for. And that's why I like Psalm 50. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So, George, what stood out for you then in that as we wrap up uh, these uh, psalms and challenging times? I think there was a lot of helpful lessons. I think like you were saying towards the end, Darren, um, that aspect of knowing, you know, at times you feel like a failure. Um, you feel like you missed the mark, not just daily, but hourly, minutely, yeah. if you're anything like yeah. me. And yeah. um, it's that, that reassurance that, you know, God's not asking us to do these, um, you know, big, massive tasks or, or make all these offerings. He just wants our heart and he wants us to turn back to him. And it always reminds one of my favorite verses in the Bible is um, James chapter four, verse eight, where it's draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Yeah. And I always think God never moves. God's always there. It's us that yeah. go away yeah. and draw back to him. That, sorry, Joe, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I'm, I'm glad you picked up that point as well about this. You know, get, don't get too hard on yourself. We should be hard on ourselves in one sense, but we realise that God has done so much for us to be forgiven. But it's lovely that you've just picked out from James. James was the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. One of the Psalms that I touched upon just by number was Psalm uh, 69, I think it was. That's when it's all about Jesus's brothers denying him. So the person who says that is the one who denied his own brother but now he's drawing unto God and God is going to pull him back. Yeah. Wow. And Jesus brought him back. It's, it's lovely, isn't it? And so none of us, none of us are unsuitable for giving praise to God. No. None of us are beyond forgiveness, mm -hmm. thankfully. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's all done. God's done all of this through, we, we see the salvation in Jesus. And uh, like you said, that's just a beautiful concept to to go away and think about in in challenging times yeah so. yeah great well thanks very much for sharing those thoughts with us and uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on and thank you george for contributing with us and thanks everyone for watching uh we hope you've uh, been encouraged by the psalms we have and uh that you can turn to god in these challenging times too thanks all god bless god bless, god bless.